No man achieves great success who is unwilling to make personal sacrifices. Chapter 10 Persistence The Sustained Effort Necessary to Induce Faith The Eighth Step Toward Riches Persistence is an essential factor in the procedure of transmuting desire into its monetary equivalent. The basis of persistence is the power of will. Willpower and desire, when properly combined, make an irresistible pair. Those who accumulate great fortunes are sometimes called cold-blooded or ruthless. Frequently, it is simply because their critics simply don't understand that what they have is a strong desire, backed up by willpower, which they mix with persistence. It is the combination that ensures the attainment of their objectives. The majority of people are ready to throw their aims and purposes overboard and give up at the first sign of opposition or misfortune. A few carry on despite all opposition until they attain their goal. There may be no heroic connotation to the word persistence, but persistence does for your character what carbon does to iron. It hardens it to steel. The building of a fortune will involve the application of the entire 13 factors of this philosophy. These principles must be understood, and they must be applied with persistence by all who accumulate money. Your Test of Persistence If you are reading this book with the intention of seriously applying the knowledge, the first test of your persistence will come when you begin to follow the six steps described in the third chapter, Desire. Unless you are one of the few people who already have a definite goal and a definite plan for its attainment, you may read the instructions, but you will never actually apply them in your daily life. Lack of persistence is one of the major causes of failure. Moreover, my experience with thousands of people has proved that lack of persistence is a weakness common to the majority of people. However, it is a weakness that may be overcome by effort. The ease with which lack of persistence may be conquered will depend entirely upon the intensity of your desire. The starting point of all achievement is desire. Keep this constantly in mind. Weak desires bring weak results, just as a small amount of fire makes a small amount of heat. If you are lacking in persistence, this weakness may be remedied by building a stronger fire under your desires. Continue reading through to the end of this book. Then go back to chapter 3 and start immediately to carry out the instructions for using the six steps. The eagerness with which you follow these instructions will indicate clearly how much or how little you really desire to accumulate money. If you find that you are indifferent, you may be sure that you have not yet acquired the money consciousness that you must possess before you can be sure of accumulating a fortune. Fortunes gravitate to those whose minds have been prepared to attract them, just as surely as water gravitates to the ocean. If you are weak in persistence, focus on the instructions in Chapter 11, Power of the Mastermind. Surround yourself with a mastermind group, and through the cooperation of the members of this group, you can develop persistence. You will find additional instructions for the development of persistence in Chapter 5, Autosuggestion, and in Chapter 13, The Subconscious Mind. Follow the instructions in these chapters until you build up habits that convey to your subconscious mind a clear picture of the object of your desire. From that point on, you will not be handicapped by lack of persistence. Your subconscious mind works continuously while you are awake and while you are asleep. Are you money conscious or poverty conscious? Occasional effort to apply the rules will be of no value to you. To get results, you must apply all of the rules until they become a fixed habit with you. In no other way can you develop the necessary money consciousness. Just as money is attracted to those who have deliberately set their mind on it, poverty is attracted to those whose mind is open to it. And although money consciousness must be developed intentionally, Poverty consciousness develops without conscious application of habits favorable to it. Poverty consciousness will seize the mind that is not occupied with money consciousness. 
If you understand the point of the preceding paragraph, you will understand the importance of persistence in the accumulation of a fortune. Without persistence, you will be defeated even before you start. With persistence, you will win. If you have ever had a nightmare, you will realize the value of persistence. You are lying in bed, half awake, with a feeling that you are about to smother. You are unable to turn over or to move a muscle. You realize that you must begin to regain control over your muscles. Through persistent effort of willpower, you finally manage to move the fingers of one hand. By continuing to move your fingers, you extend your control to the muscles of one arm until you can lift it. Then you gain control of the other arm. You finally gain control over the muscles of one leg and then extend it to the other leg. Then, with one supreme effort of will, you regain complete control over your muscular system and snap out of your nightmare. You did it step by step. You may find it necessary to snap yourself out of your mental inertia in a similar way. First, by moving slowly, then increasing your speed until you gain complete control over your will. Be persistent, no matter how slowly you may have to move at first. With persistence will come success. Snap out of mental inertia. If you select your mastermind group with care, you will have in it at least one person who will aid you in the development of persistence. Some people who have accumulated great fortunes did so because of necessity. They developed the habit of persistence because circumstances forced them to become persistent. Those who have cultivated the habit of persistence seem to enjoy insurance against failure. No matter how many times they are defeated, they finally arrive up toward the top of the ladder. Sometimes it appears that there is a hidden guide whose duty is to test us through all sorts of discouraging experiences. Those who pick themselves up after defeat and keep on trying finally arrive, and the world says, I knew you could do it. The hidden guide lets no one enjoy great achievement without passing the persistence test. Those who can't take it simply do not make the grade. Those who can take it are rewarded for their persistence, and in return they get the goal they are pursuing. But that is not all. They receive something infinitely more important than material compensation, the knowledge that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. Persist past your failures. The people who learn from experience the importance of persistence will not accept defeat as being anything more than temporary. They are the ones whose desires are so persistently applied that defeat is finally changed into victory. We see that an overwhelmingly large number of people go down in defeat, never to rise again. We also see the few who take the punishment of defeat as an urge to greater effort. But what we do not see what most of us never suspect of existing, is the silent but irresistible power that comes to the rescue of those who fight on in the face of discouragement. If we speak of this power at all, we call it persistence and let it go at that. One thing is sure, if you do not have persistence, you will not achieve noteworthy success in any calling. As I am writing these lines, I can look out the window and see, less than a block away, the great mysterious Broadway, the graveyard of dead hopes, and the front porch of opportunity. From all over the world, people have come to Broadway seeking fame, fortune, power, love, or whatever it is that human beings call success. Once in a great while, someone steps out from the long procession of seekers, and the world hears that another person has conquered Broadway. But Broadway is not easily nor quickly conquered. Broadway acknowledges talent, recognizes genius, and pays off in money only after a person has refused to quit. The secret is always inseparably attached to one word, persistence. Editor's Comments Today we think of making it on Broadway in terms of the theater, but here Napoleon Hill uses Broadway as a metaphor for the New York arts, publishing, and entertainment industries in general. 
In the original edition of Think and Grow Rich, Hill used this introduction to tell of Fanny Hurst, one of the best-selling authors of the day, who pounded the streets of New York for four years and received 36 rejection slips from one publisher alone before her persistence paid off and she finally got published. Although Napoleon Hill chose Fanny Hurst to illustrate his point about overcoming poverty and adversity, he knew all about both from personal experience. Hill's own story is one of very humble beginnings and devastating failures that would have defeated most people. It was only through his extraordinary persistence that the original edition of the book you hold in your hands was published. And for that reason, the editors of this edition have included this brief biography of Napoleon Hill. The following is adapted from A Lifetime of Riches, The Biography of Napoleon Hill, written by Michael J. Ritt, Jr. and Kirk Landers, and also draws upon Napoleon Hill's first bestseller, his four-volume masterwork, Law of Success. In it, Hill told of the seven turning points in his own life, and those excerpts told in his words are told in the first person. Born into poverty in the backwoods of Virginia, young Knapp, as he was called, was the local gun-toting troublemaker. He would probably have ended up a criminal had his widowed father not met and married Martha Ramey Banner. Knapp's new stepmother set out to change the family's mountain ways, and she started by trading Napoleon a typewriter for his six-shooter pistol. She told him, If you become as good with a typewriter as you are with that gun, you may become rich and famous and known throughout the world. Her faith and encouragement turned young Knapp around, and by the age of 15, he was submitting stories to the local newspapers and doing everything he could to get himself out of his meager circumstance. After completing high school and one year at a business college, he wrote an audacious letter to Rufus Ayers, one of the most powerful men in the coal industry. Hill wrote to apply for a job, but he said that he didn't want a salary. In fact, he said he would pay Ayers. Hill proposed that Ayers could charge him whatever he wanted on a monthly basis, but if at the end of three months Hill had proved his worth, he then would expect Ayers to pay him a salary of the same monthly amount. Ayers admired Hill's style and hired him with pay. First Turning Point After finishing a course at a business college, I took a job as stenographer and bookkeeper. As a result of having practiced the habit of performing more work and better work than that for which I was paid, I advanced rapidly until I was assuming responsibilities and receiving a salary far out of proportion to my age. Hill also proved to be so trustworthy and honest that Ayers promoted him to replace the manager, making this 19-year-old the youngest manager of a mine and in charge of 350 men. Then fate reached out and gave me a gentle nudge. My employer lost his fortune, and I lost my position. This was my first real defeat, and even though it came about as a result of causes beyond my control, I didn't learn a lesson from it until many years later. Second Turning Point My next position was that of sales manager for a large lumber manufacturer in the South. My advancement was rapid and I did so well that my employer took me into partnership with him. We began to make money, and I began to see myself on top of the world again. Like a stroke of lightning out of a clear sky, the 1907 panic swept down, and overnight it rendered me an enduring service by destroying our business and relieving me of every dollar that I had. Editor's Comment The panic Hill refers to began in the summer of 1907, when a number of banks and stock brokerages declared bankruptcy. Word spread to the general public, and it created a run on the banks as depositors lined up to demand that they be given the money they had on deposit. Banks called in loans to meet the demand for cash. But those borrowers couldn't find buyers for their goods or property, so they couldn't pay back their loans. When the banks couldn't get back the money they had loaned, they repossessed the homes or businesses that the borrowers had put up as collateral. Businesses were closed, farmers were evicted from their land, jobs were lost, so even more banks were forced to close, and it just kept getting worse. 
America was caught in a downward spiral that was reversed only when the major Wall Street bankers and financial executives, who were themselves in danger of losing their businesses, stepped in to shore up troubled banks. It was in large part because of the bank panic of 1907 that legislation was enacted in 1913 to create the Federal Reserve System. This is the end of the editor's comments. Third Turning Point This was my first serious defeat. I mistook it, then, for failure, but it was not. And before I complete this lesson, I will tell you why it was not. It required the 1907 panic and the defeat that it brought me to redirect my efforts from the lumber business to the study of law. I entered law school with the firm belief that I would emerge doubly prepared to catch up with the end of the rainbow and claim my pot of gold. Napoleon Hill planned to put himself and his brother through law school by writing articles for Bob Taylor's magazine. It was through the magazine that he arranged the fateful meeting with Andrew Carnegie, described at the beginning of this book. As was noted there, when Carnegie proposed the idea of writing the philosophy of success, he told Hill that he would have to earn his own way. I attended law school at night and worked as an automobile salesman during the day. Because of the job, I saw the need for trained automobile mechanics. I opened an educational department in the manufacturing plant and began to train ordinary machinists in automobile assembly and repair work. The school prospered, paying me over a thousand dollars a month in net profits. My banker knew that I was prospering, therefore he loaned me money with which to expand. A peculiar trait of bankers is that they will loan us money without any hesitation when we are prosperous. My banker loaned me money until I was hopelessly in his debt, then he took over my business as calmly as if it had belonged to him, which it did. From an income of more than a thousand dollars a month, I was suddenly reduced to poverty. For the third time, Hill had experienced defeat, but he was not beaten. He got another job, and all the while continued to work on the Carnegie Project. Fourth Turning Point, 1912 Because my wife's family had influence, I secured the appointment as assistant to the chief counsel for one of the largest coal companies in the world. I was among friends and relatives, and I had a position that I could keep for as long as I wished without exerting myself. What more did I need? Nothing, I was beginning to say to myself. Then, without consultation with my friends and without warning, I resigned. This was the first turning point that was of my own selection. It was not forced upon me. I quit that position because the work was too easy and I was performing it with too little effort. This move proved to be the next most important turning point of my life, although it was followed by ten years of effort that brought almost every conceivable grief the human heart can experience. I selected Chicago as my new field of endeavor. I made up my mind that if I could gain recognition in Chicago, in any honorable sort of work, it would prove that I had something that might be developed into real ability. Fifth Turning Point my first position in Chicago was that of advertising manager for a large correspondence school. I did so well that the president of the school induced me to resign my position and go into the candy manufacturing business with him. We organized the Betsy Ross Candy Company, and I became its first president. The business grew rapidly, and soon we had a chain of stores in 18 different cities. They did so well, in fact. Hill's partners decided they wanted to take over the business. They had Hill arrested on a false charge and then offered to withdraw the charge if he would turn over to them his interest in the business. Outraged at the suggestion, Hill refused. When the case went to court, his partners failed to appear for the hearing. Hill sued them for malicious damage to his character. The judge's ruling completely vindicated Hill and allowed him the option to have his partners thrown in jail. Being arrested seemed at the time a terrible disgrace, even though the charge was false. It was not a pleasant experience, and I would not wish to go through a similar experience again, but I must admit that it was worth all the grief it cost me, because it gave me the opportunity to find out that revenge 
was not a part of my makeup. Sixth Turning Point This turning point came shortly after my dreams of success in the candy business had been shattered when I turned my efforts to teaching advertising and salesmanship as a department of one of the colleges in the Midwest. My school prospered from the very beginning. I had a resident class and also a correspondence school through which I was teaching students in nearly every English-speaking country. It was 1917, and in April of that year, President Woodrow Wilson declared the United States would enter the war against Germany. Hill contacted the President, who he had previously met through Andrew Carnegie, and offered his services to help the war effort. Hill was given the position of creating public relations materials and helping to sell war bonds. When not operating his school, he threw himself into his war work, for which he insisted that he be paid only one dollar a year. Then came the second military draft, and it practically destroyed my school, as it caught most of those who were enrolled as students. At one stroke, I charged off more than $75,000 in tuition fees. Once more, I was penniless. Despite the fact that Hill had to scrape just to get by, he continued to work for President Wilson and continued to refuse to take any compensation. Though Hill had a family to support and the ridicule of his relatives put a tremendous strain on relations, he also continued to work on the Carnegie Project. Hill later said, Believe me, there were times when between the needling of my relatives and the hardships I endured, it was not easy to maintain a positive mental attitude and persevere. Sometimes in barren hotel rooms, I almost believed my family was right. The thing that kept me going was my conviction that one day I would not only successfully complete my work, but also be proud of myself when it was finished. Yeah! I'm Rosaribe Mike. Promotional Cup. Sim, sim.